Welcome to our channel. A channel that faithfully accompanies you and can take you to the past. Please and make sure to subscribe so that you are always connected. Nguyen Van Bay is a Vietnamese pilot. Let's follow in his footsteps. I hope you enjoy following along. In memory of Nguyen Van Bay, the down-to-earth ace of North Vietnam. Nguyen Van Bay spent his old age in a peaceful village that was once affected by war by growing vegetables, raising fish and living like an ordinary farmer. The place he lives in has undergone tremendous changes in nearly a decade. The village where Bay lives has a good traffic system, electricity network and clean water supply. At the time several Vietnamese writers visited, their cars could only stop about two kilometers from Bay's house. Bay had to ride his motorbike to bring his group of guests to his house. Entering the house, there was ready to drink tea on the table and Bay himself brought a box of beer. Bay urged his wife to bring food. When one of his guests showed some reluctance, Bay said, You all came here to see me, so I have to treat you well. It is our tradition. Even though his eyes had shown the age of aging, his speech was still very clear. Bay still remembers every event that has happened years before. Bay seems excited to retell the memories of his youth. He spoke with his eyes, face and hands. He recalled that he never finished elementary school. However, he managed to continue his studies and become a fighter jet pilot. Bay said that his ancestors and not even his parents had ever dreamed of flying jet planes and emphasized that if his country did not believe in him and entrust him with flying MiG-17s, he might not stand a chance to become a hero. Last week, the down-to-earth Vietnamese hero died on September 22, 2019 at 9 p.m. at the 175 military hospital in Ho Chi Minh City after a week of intensive care. Bay was transferred to the hospital on September 16th in a coma caused by a brain hemorrhage. He collapsed while working in the garden of his home in the Mekong Delta province of Dong Tha. Bay died at the age of 84. Early career. Bay was born in 1937 near Saigon, the seventh of 11 children. He went north at the age of 16 to join the Viet Minh and join the war against France. When that war ended in July 1954 with a peace treaty that divided his country, he chose to remain in the north. At this time he lost contact with his family. He then volunteered for flight training in 1962 and was among the first North Vietnamese pilots sent to China to learn to fly fighter planes. Bay said he went straight from learning to ride a bicycle to learning to fly a plane. He only learned to drive the old car after he started flight training. The students began learning to fly on the Yak-18, then on the MiG-15, and finally on the MiG-17. It took four years to train, all in China, says Bay. We have Russian instructors, other trainees, including Du Wei Hoang, who joined at the same time as Bay and went with him to China, took the first year of training in China and continued two years later in Russia. Like US pilots, North Vietnamese pilots typically spent 200 hours flying in training before going into combat. Cadets Bay, Chao, and Hoang gained about 100 hours of experience in the MiG-17. Getting flying wings is not easy for Bay. I was sore all the time in the early part of training, he says, so I cut a soccer ball in half, tied it with string, and hung it around my neck when I flew. Every time I vomited, I would vomit into that place. Bay was still in training in 1964, the first year North Vietnam was attacked by U.S. aircraft. On August 5th, two U.S. carriers launched attacks on shore targets, in attacks billed as retaliation for North Vietnamese torpedo boat attacks on U.S. destroyers gathering intelligence signals in the Gulf of Tonkin. At that time the VPAF had just received about 36 MiG-17 fighters and MiG-15 UTI trainer jets from the Soviet Union. 
but the North Vietnamese were afraid to waste their new aircraft and pilots against the U.S. attack. They chose to remain silent and recruited more youths to be trained in flying. The following year, Bay returned to Vietnam, when a U.S. plane landed, had started a continuous bombing campaign named Operation Rolling Thunder. This time the VPAF was ready to send MiGs to attack them. From April to December 1965, VPAF aircraft challenged U.S. warplanes in 156 air battles and claimed 15 victories. Combat career. Bay's first engagement came on October 6, 1965. At that time she was attacked by a U.S. Navy F-4 piloted almost certainly by Dan McIntyre and radar intercept officer Alan Johnson who reported firing an AIM-7D missile at a MiG-17 and claiming a, possibly, Bay remembered a missile that exploded from his left wing. I felt the heat from the explosion, he said. The plane dived and started shaking. He immediately turned around toward Noi Bai airfield, just north of Hanoi, and maintained the plane until it landed safely. On land, he counted 82 holes in his plane. I feel like a lightweight boxer confidently walking into the ring and trying to knock out a heavyweight boxer, says Bay. It wasn't a single fight but dozens of dogfights going on there. We were outnumbered 4 or 5 to 1. Our thoughts at that time were how to survive, nothing more. Liu Wei Chao recalled that the possibility of encountering an F-4 dominated his thinking in training. Chao, like Bay, had also fought the French and learned to fly airplanes before he learned to drive a car. Our training in VPAF pilots got their attack guidance by a ground control intercept, GCI, radar installation located on the outskirts of Hanoi and close to the coast near Haiphong. The radar shows an image of an ongoing dogfight with ground control officers, who managed the intercept mission from the primary radar van over Hanoi. Ground control officers command the ambush, keep surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, from firing on VPAF aircraft, and make the final decision about whether to engage the aircraft in an attack. They are very helpful but can also be wrong. Bay recalls returning to the Kep airstrip with four other aircraft when he saw a SAM coming towards them. We think the missiles were fired to protect us from the American fighters that were reported to be behind us, Bay said. The missile exploded right at the MiG that was leading the way. The pilot immediately ejected, cluttered a lot of discussion about how to fight the F-4, he recalls. Which was considered the worst threat because of its sophistication. American warplanes can fly faster than ours, Bay said. We have to force him to turn. When they turned, the speed was no longer a problem. We could take advantage of our aircraft's more agile turning abilities and bypass their circular maneuvers to then come within effective range of our guns. Quote, the MiG Bay guns were first effectively used in late April 1966. At that time, North Vietnamese radar networks indicated that U.S. aircraft were approaching Bac Sun and Dinh Sia, the coastal districts where American attack aircraft were heading. An officer led four MiG-17s to meet them. Bay, Chao, and Tran Triem followed Ho Van Quai's trail. Shortly after takeoff, Bay sighted eight F-4S. One of them flew wide as the attacking formation reversed. Bay cut him off and closed the range. When I saw all the F-4s in the windscreen. I fired, he said, and the F-4 went down. He later wrote to his new bride, an accounting student at university in Hanoi, that this was the first American plane I have shot down. Bay had been married for just over a week at the time, he remembered. The wedding only took 15 minutes. I took off my flight suit, put on civilian clothes, went into the Sia Bay has all three of his cannons ready to go at this point. I rolled on the back of the Phantom, he said. Our sights are bad. What I need to do is close in at close to 100 to 150 meters and start shooting. 
I would make the firing adjustments looking at the direction of the tracer. Buchanan recalls telling Robertson, this guy is approaching us. He's ready to shoot at any moment now. At that moment, our salvo of orange, golf ball-sized cannonballs flashed over the Buchanan canopy. Robertson tried to stay away, but Buchanan saw that the MiG could keep their distance again. He said, finally here he is, he managed to solve the problem. Bay trailed, fired again, and saw a fragment roll out from under the F-4's wing and fly through its canopy. For Buchanan, things are looking dark. Could this be due to a lot of G-force pulling the blood from my eye? I'm not too sure, he said. My helmet hit something. I really don't have a clear memory of how I ejected. However, I felt a tug on the F-4's grip that was between its legs. The next thing I knew, my parachute was open. When I came down I could see people running below in a small village. I can see a man on the right, looking like he's wearing a uniform and a rifle, running towards me. Buchanan was captured and remained in custody until 1973. Bay drove away from the burning Phantom, then rolled back to see what was happening. He watched the planes fly in flames. I saw one parachute, he said. Robbie did not manage to escape death that time. Emony, and had time to smoke a cigarette, says Bay. Then I put my flight suit back on and went back to duty. I flew into combat for 12 days straight before I saw him again. Chow recalled that pilots sometimes slept under the wings of their planes when they were on alert. On a typical day, we're on the plane at 8 or 8.30 in the morning and getting ready to fly anytime, he said. Sometimes the flying orders come by shooting flares. At other times, a bell is used. The bells are made from US. Bomb casings. Whose explosives have been released. Bells are then hung from trees and hammers are used to sound the alarm ready to fly. In the summer of 1966, US. Troops. Launched regular strikes against Hanoi, Haiphong Port, other military and industrial centers in northern Vietnam, and MiG-21s began to join the battle. Bay shot down another plane, an F-105, in June and remembers what he and his colleagues thought when a wave of U.S. planes landed. Kept coming. The American people are very well equipped. Their planes are more modern and larger in number. We all know their strength. Their weakness is that they have to fly from afar. They all also felt thousands of eyes staring at him and thousands of guns ready to shoot at him from below. Their eyes couldn't concentrate 100% on our plane. Therefore we usually find them before they find us. Bay explained his strategy. The most important thing is to find the enemy first, he said, to gain speed and fly higher, to get a better position. We learned many lessons and learned many famous dogfight tactics from World War II between the Soviets and Germans. As well as dogfights in the Pacific where propeller planes and cannons were still used. Whoever shoots first wins. Quote. On the 16th of September 1966 an alarm was heard ringing at the Jialam airfield near Hanoi in the late afternoon. Bay flew the third in a four-plane flight led by Ho Van Kwai, pronounced Ho Von Ki, to have a kill record on one F-4. By this time, Bay already had a kill record consisting of an F-4, a Navy Vought F-8 Crusader, and a Republic F-105 Thunderchief. Liu Wei Chao, pronounced Liu Wei Chao, flies as the lead wingman. Chao also claimed three kills up to that point and would eventually become an ace. Bay was the first to spot flight Major John, Robbie, Robertson. When he requested permission to attack, Kwai expressed doubt that the slower mix could catch up to the F-4 in front. But as the mix tried in vain to close the gap, Bay saw the Phantoms make a mistake. He saw them starting to climb. According to Hubert Buchanan, Robbie's backseater, their plane also flew at position number three in their flight. 
It was Buchanan's 17th combat mission that saw one of the largest strike groups he had ever joined. We are trying to avoid radar detection, he said. We were flying a little low, but not so low that we could get ground fire, and at that time a big attack was underway. Many planes fly in that place. And somewhere between Haiphong and Hanoi, I think more towards Hanoi, one of our flight members shouted that there was a MiG at 6 o'clock. At that point, we all dropped all of our weapons and fuel tanks, and started turning uphill to the left, that was not a good plan. The MiGs began to cut our flight path and climb too. Quote, Although the GCI's radar guidance had given Bay many advantages in combat, on September 21, 1966, the GCI failed him. Commanded by ground control to the target 10 miles ahead of his four-plane flight, Bay, after flying for about seven minutes, spotted two F-105s from about 10,000 to 13,000 feet. He then banked to give chase, then came out of the turn just behind one of the pair of F-105s, but well out of range of his fire. Knowing that the Thunder Chiefs usually fly in a four-plane formation, Bay scans the sky for the others. Usually they are easy to spot. Long black smoke usually comes from their engine. The Thunder Chief's dark green and brown camouflage is hard to see against the jungle backdrop. But Bay saw nothing. After making sure there were no other planes, he gave permission for his wingman, the Wee Hoang, to attack one of the two thuds. American pilots. Flying without ground radar guidance tended to stay together in what they called a welded wing, a defensive position that required a wingman to stay close to the leader to cover the rear of the formation, while the leader concentrated on what was at hand, in front and do the shooting. However, the tactic of separating the wingmen from their leader so that they are forced to operate separately has become a common procedure in the VPAF. Hoang flew wide to the left, flew behind the second F-105, and, with Bay, waited for his target to turn. Suddenly both thuds made a low turn. We were ambushed, said Bay. Flying low, too low to be picked up by GCI radar, and well behind the main F-105 element were pilots of First Lieutenant Carl Richter and Captain Ralph J. Beardsley. As the main attacking element maneuvered to find Sam's sights to attack, Richter and his wingmen remained low, prepared to follow them to their target. Then Richter saw the MiG. He later wrote in the November 1967 issue of Airman magazine, they rolled in front of us beautifully, a mile and a half or two. This is funny. We had very few opportunities to meet, with MiG. It might take a full second before alerting you. MiG, it's not an airplane like we're used to flying. Richter discarded his rocket pod, readied his M61 Gatling gun, and positioned himself to the left of the MiG. He swerves easily, Richter wrote. I moved the Pippa, aim, right in front of him and started shooting. Richter continued to fire the 20mm cannon at 100 rounds per second. I thought it would be a shame if I failed to take this down, then Beardsley called out, you hit it. You hit it. Richter saw sparks coming out of the end of the MiG, but he still seemed to be moving fine in the sky. Meanwhile Hoang heard a thump. The plane shakes. Alarmed, he turned on the afterburners as the plane continued to turn to the right while he tried to regain control of the plane. The plane responded but it was clear something was wrong. Hoang looked around and saw the outside of his left flank was tattered. I'm still flying, so I'm just concentrating on staying under control. Richter fired again as Hoang had just finished checking his machine's instruments. The VK-1A turbojets worked fine. I thought I would be fine, when suddenly the plane started to fall apart. The instrument panel is destroyed. Hoang felt pain in his side and back. He reached between his legs for the eject lever. When Richter ran out of ammunition, the MiG's right wing was cut off. 
Pieces of metal flew off the tail and another large chunk fell off the plane. As Richter lifted the plane to clear the debris, he saw the MiG pilot eject and heard Beardsley announce, the parachute is working. The two Thunder Chiefs immediately took off at top speed. Meanwhile, one F-4 flight entered the battlefield. Alone, Bay dodged one missile after another released by the Phantoms. She used sharp cornering maneuvers to outmaneuver the attackers, but these cost altitude and fuel. I can dodge the missiles, he said, but I'm in a very serious situation. Fuel is running low. At first I intended to reject, but as I descended lower, I suddenly saw the American planes flying away. Then I saw, Vo Van, man in front of me. I followed man, and landed safely. Hoang landed in the paddy field. When he shouted that he was on their side, local villagers heard his southern accent and thought he was a South Vietnamese pilot, who was hated even more than the Americans. They took off my flying suit and tied my hands behind my back, said Hoang. A farmer started beating me until the soldiers made him stop. Hoang couldn't walk, so the soldiers put him on a two-wheeled buffalo cart to be pulled into town. It took an hour for those who arrested him to verify his identity. Once they did, they quickly untied him and rushed him to the hospital. After recovering from his injuries, Hoang began flying a MiG-21 and was shot down again on the 29th of September 1967. Hoang's left arm and throat still show the scars from Richter's attack. Richter himself was killed 10 months later. In April 1967, Bay claimed three more U.S. aircraft. On April 24, Bay, assigned as flight leader, was routed from the Kiannan airfield. The flight's mission was to intercept a United States Navy airstrike on the Haiphong docks. Bay approached an F-8 Crusader piloted by Lieutenant C.D.R. E.J. Tucker, and shot him. Tucker ejected but later died in North Vietnamese custody. The escorting F-4s then counterattacked Bay's lead flight. The F-4 fired several sidewinders at Bay, but with his wingman's warning, he was able to evade him all. Bay was then able to maneuver into a good firing position where he subsequently downed one of the attacking American aircraft. However, the crew of the F-4, Lieutenant C.D.R. C. E. Southwick and Enns. J. W. Land believed they had been shot down by an AAA not a MiG plane. The next day Bay and his flight were able to down two American A-4 Skyhawks. One A-4 was shot down by Bay himself, while the other was shot down by his wingman. In 1971, Bay and fellow pilot Le Xuen Dai were trained in anti-ship attack by Cuban advisors. On the 19th of April 1972, two men from the 923rd Fighter Regiment flew their MiG-17s, each armed with two 500 pounds bombs, into the open sea on the mission that became known as the Battle of Dong Hoi. Le Xuen Dai led a flight to attack the U.S. destroyer USS Higby, while Nguyen Van Bay engaged the light cruiser USS Oklahoma City, which had fired on targets in Vin City. Two of Bay's bombs caused little damage to Oklahoma City, possibly due to a near-miss detonation, while Dai was able to drop a bomb directly on the destroyer Higby's 5 inches gun turret with one of her two 500 pounds bombs. This was the first successful airstrike by North Vietnamese fighter jets on U.S. Navy warships actively engaged in combat. USS Sterrett, which was providing escort for the damaged battleship, reportedly destroyed an enemy MiG aircraft. After the initial attack, USS Sterrett fired her RIM-2 Terrier missile and destroyed the SSN-2 Styx missile. The missile is thought to have been launched from a North Vietnamese patrol boat. Awards and recognition. Bay was awarded the Heroes Medal of the Vietnamese People's Army for his exceptional skill and bravery in battle, and for his great leadership in battle. His win made headlines. A popular and briefly favorite of Ho Chi Minh. 
He had regular dinners with the leader and was grounded again, at first temporarily and then permanently, for no other reason than to protect his value as a symbol of victory. Of the 16 VPAF pilots who achieved ace status, only three, including Bei and Liu Wei Chao, flew MiG-17s. Another 13 flew the newer MiG-21 model. A Delta Wing aircraft equipped with a radar and heat-seeking missiles and considered to be quite comparable to the F-4 and F-8 in maneuverability and acceleration. The old MiG-17 made in the 1950s was difficult to control in roll and pitch maneuvers at high speeds. The plane has no radar and no missiles, except the final variant. The aircraft was armed with 137mm and 223mm guns. The sites had no rangefinder 7 radar, that's why Bay had to keep an eye on the tracer bullets and adjust his aim. The MiG-17's advantages were good visibility and excellent turning speed, but it was outnumbered by the more modern US Phantoms, Crusaders, and Thunder Chiefs. The Americans claimed to have shot down some 195 MiGs between June 17, 1965, and January 12, 1973. For a MiG pilot, surviving nearly eight years of war was an extraordinary feat. With his former enemy. After the war, Nguyen Van Bay attended several reunions held both in San Diego, America, and in Vietnam itself with American pilots who were former enemies. In reunions where sometimes the opening words are, you shot down my plane. The atmosphere that is created is an atmosphere of friendship and not hatred, where those who have experienced the bitterness of war have long since buried their hostility. We are friends now, said Nguyen Van Bay through an interpreter. American pilots were ordered there, sent there to defend their country. If we don't shoot them, they will shoot us. We do our job. That is the past. Now we are friends. Recipient of the Navy Cross, America's second highest military decoration, Captain. Ench said that the two delegates may find it easier to come to terms with the past because they're aviators. Where aerial combat while both instilling fear, they are still far from the horrors and brutality wars that often arise in land battles. Colonel Bay, who was highly praised in Hanoi as North Vietnam's first ace, said fame only comes second today, because they want to make peace with America. I believe Americans are good people, he said. But I have a bad feeling for your leaders, who led your country to war. Presidents, Lyndon, Johnson and, Richard, Nixon said they would take North Vietnam into the Stone Age. So, viewers. Now we end the story here. Thank you and see you soon.